Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 273. Now, talking of fitness legends, we have a fitness legend on the show today. The man has many, many, many books, far more than I will probably ever write. He is still looking in fantastic shape. He still has the passion for fitness. Lou Schuler, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ben. Great to be here. It's great to have you. Um, It's not often we get people, well, it is often we get people with massive pedigrees, but you have a huge pedigree. You also have a huge pedigree in a huge fitness market, which is the US. Um, Sure I do, but uh, yeah, let's let's not talk about me like I'm dead here. I mean, I don't want this to turn into a eulogy. Uh, I know, did you just say before we started that you're 60 now? I'm 60, yes. I'm interested. How long do you think you'll still be in the fitness game? Um, you know, here's here's the joke I always make about about writers, which is, you know, a lot of a lot of people in our field, young people like you who who have done extremely well, they talk about I want to retire at 40 and go do something else. I want to retire at 50 and go do something else. Writers don't think like that. The way we think is we can't retire. We never retire. And basically If we go like two years where nobody pays us for anything, then we start telling people we're retired. But we never we never do it voluntarily. So I'm in this for as long. I'm in this for as long as this wants me. Let's put it that way. I agree. Uh, When people talk about like early retirement and like can't wait and all that kind of stuff, I I talk to my family and like I'll I'll stop doing stuff when I'm literally dead, when I've like lost capacity. Because for me, like. What do you stay passionate about? You might do a little bit less because you have less capacity and you want to spend more time with grandkids and stuff, but you just, you keep creating, you keep trying to make the world a better place, surely. Uh, I, I, I know I do. Um, there's certainly an economic necessity there, uh, but there's also just, I don't know, I don't know what else I would do. I mean, I love to work out. I always have. And I love to write. I always have. So getting to write about fitness and health and, and nutrition and, and, you know, a little psychology thrown in. Um, I don't know what else I would do. I mean, there's things I would fantasize about doing like writing fiction and people actually reading it. That'd be great, but that's not going to happen. So, um, so I'll keep doing this. So I'm intrigued. You've been in fitness a huge amount of time. You've seen trains right. come and go. You've trained yourself in different ways. You've strength trained, hypertrophy, done loads of different things. What does a man that's 60 that has this huge background, what, what do you do right now for your fitness? Uh, what I have to do is subtract. Uh, this is the toughest thing. It was, it was brutal on the ego. And now when you say that I've been in you know, fitness and doing all these things, I was, um, and, 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 I, and I don't say this, um, for false modesty. This is genuine modesty. There's nothing false about it. I was always the last kid picked. I was always the worst kid on teams because I was like the skinniest, weakest, most four-eyed kid uh, who actually wanted to play sports. And that was the thing. I wanted to do this stuff. I wasn't any good at it. So when I came across um, this idea that I could get these weights and I could work out with them, I started doing that at 13 with my older brother who was, who was 15 at the time. I thought, okay, if I can get stronger, then I can do this thing that I've always wanted to do, which is play sports. And then eventually I really enjoyed working out and I wanted to continue doing that. But it all started with not being good at anything. And then once I started working out, I I never got jacked. I never got especially strong. I have no background in sports. I have no background in powerlifting, bodybuilding, all those other things. All I know is I really have always enjoyed this stuff and I've always wanted to sort of um, help other people achieve the modest uh, gains and benefits that I have uh, without ever pretending that I'm coming to them um, with any level of expertise other than that of an enthusiast who's tried and who's had the opportunity to work with a lot of really great people who really understand this stuff and have worked with all these athletes or they've been the athletes They've been the bodybuilders, powerlifters. I can work with them and get their thoughts, share it with readers. So that's, you know, so when we talk about my background, that's always been, I've always been the conduit from these guys into the thing I'm passionate about and, and then to the thing the readers are passionate about. Now you say, what changes when you're 60? Um, you, you've got, I, you just have to subtract stuff. I mean, 
I, I, I'll still see articles every now and then. Somebody goes, oh, age is just a number. And they'll show a picture of like some 900-year-old, you know, bodybuilder dude. And it's like, look at him. He can still do this and that. It's like, there's one of him. <laughs> yeah. And there's millions of me. And I and people like me and people with normal genetics can't do this stuff. So we have to subtract. You know, barbell exercise is gone. Uh, I used to be able to to uh, continue. You know, the last barbell exercise I could do was deadlifts. And uh, a couple of years ago, I hurt my back on a warm-up set, and that was that for, <laughs> for barbell deadlifts. So it's uh, the, the, the aging process is a process of subtracting. It makes workouts a little bit more um, per, perhaps repetitive, and uh, there's just my, my repertoire of exercises just shrinks, and I'll see really cool stuff, and I'll think, wow, that would be so great, but I – can't do that. You can't do that with a 60 year old body. It, it, maybe you can get away with it for a while, but everything is always much closer to the breaking point uh, than you ever thought it would be. Mm. So let's dive back into a little bit of your history. You talked about getting your first weight set when you were younger, wanting to be into sport. Talk to me about a little bit of the transitions that you went through in the fitness industry. Because if you picked up your first weight set at 13, that's a whole load of years lifting iron. Sure. Yeah. And, and I wish I would have known what I was doing during that time. I remember, you know, it was just, we were just learning from other people who worked out in their basements like we did uh, or worked out in their garage. So we were just, you know, it was like 90% of the of, of the workout, I swear, you know, was just like over, overhead presses and bicep curls because nobody had a bench. <laughs> and then we went out, you know, to department stores and bought the cheap benches. So we had our cheap benches and we could do bench presses. Uh, never did squats until I was an adult and, and joined a gym. Uh, didn't even think, you know, a deadlift was just, you just picked up the bar off the floor to do these other exercises. So I had no idea what I was doing. Um, went at it enthusiastically. Uh, definitely got stronger. Um, but uh, it just, by what really wasn't until I was in my 30s, and I went to work at, at Weider. Um, you remember Joe Weider and yeah. Muscle and Fitness? I, yeah. I went to work for his magazine, Men's Fitness. And that's where I was first time around real information about training. And that's where I first started like, okay, now I sort of get what I'm supposed to be doing. It just took me <laughs> uh, 25 years or more, you know, to, uh, to get to the point where it's like, oh, this is what I should have been doing all along. So talking of, because what you've, started to talk about is kind of like almost principles and I intimated earlier on in the show that things come and grow in fitness all the time we see trends right. happen like cardio has right. been demonized and it's coming back a little bit more and all that kind of stuff um what foundational elements of fitness are you constantly going on about with people because there's things that we cannot get and avoid whether it's uh right whether it's a human need or it's a physiological need or the science just proves to us that we need to do it, what principles in fitness do you think we all need to be literally living and dying by before we get you know, advanced? Because there's always talk on the internet of you know, right. ketogenic this, fasting that. What should ground us? Well, okay, nutrition aside, because I, I do think that's a separate issue. I mean, I, I, I hear... I hear people say, you know, people will still say abs are made in the kitchen and it's 90% nutrition and all this stuff. And it's like, really? No, because different diets work for different people. But when we're talking about training, now we have to get back to these basic principles that you're talking about. And principle number one is exercise capacity. However you measure it by watts or by, uh, or, or by METS, metabolic equivalent of task, whatever it is, you have to have a baseline capacity. You have to be able to work before you can benefit from the work, right? So most people, you know, who, who go into the weight room for the first time or who start running for the first time, they have these basic, um, you know, they, they, they have some basic work capacity, but you have to build that up. And however you build it up, um, the benefits are going to be about the same. If you build it up in the weight room by doing a lot of, spending a lot of time in the weight room and doing a lot of hard work, you're going to build up your, uh, your, 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 training capacity, your conditioning, um, you know, the, 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 um, what, what is it, the, the power lifters call it GPP, 
So general physical preparation, mm -hmm. that is really at, at the starting point, however you do it, whether it's by running or riding a bike or swimming or in the weight room, just spending a lot of time with the iron. That's the first thing is you've got to have that work capacity before you can get much done or, or, or get much benefit out of it. Then when we're talking about the weight room, I think you have to build up a base of, a base of strength and hypertrophy will follow the strength, but build a base of strength in the in in the in the um, in the basic human movements, the basic movement patterns: squat, deadlift, or hip hinge, whatever you want to call it. Um, pulling, pushing. Uh, you should, you know, especially when you're young, be able to build up to chin ups and pull ups. Um, you certainly should uh, be able to advance from push ups to you know to to bench presses. But basically, you should be able to handle your own body weight, whether it's pulling or pushing. Um, and you should have one goal should be developing strength in these lower body movement patterns. The, the strength, uh, I'm sorry, the squat, the deadlift uh, and something with a split stance uh, or single leg. Um, so there's there's your there's your basis. Uh, I think everybody needs that to start with. And once they have that, then they can branch out in these different directions into whatever they feel most passionate about. So if we were to transition over into the diet, because looking at your diet publication history, it is far, far smaller than your training right. publication history. So right. you've got tons of incredible books, the new rules of lifting, um, the new rules of lifting for women, correct? Right, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, then you've got variations of that. Then you've got The Lean Muscle Diet, which you co-authored right. with Alan Aragon. Great book. Um, firstly, what made you transition into the diet world and what principles does that book sort of say, you've got to do this stuff before you can get specific again? Well, can I, 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 I go back farther. My sure. first book, which I started working on in 2000, came out in um, uh, like January 2002. was called The Testosterone Advantage Plan. And I wrote this with um, with uh, Mike Mejia, who is a, a trainer in New York City, with Jeff Volek, who is a very well-known nutrition researcher. He's gone far more into uh, the ketogenic uh, Atkins-type diets since then. But back then, um, what we proposed was uh, a balanced diet, um, not that different from the zone diet, but more flexible. So it wasn't a straight 40-30-30. It was based on your... Um, what what your goals were and and the proportion of protein to fat carbohydrate all that would shift as you as your goals change. Um, so that was my first book was a diet book, and then I followed that up with Home Workout Bible, uh, the Book of Muscle with Ian King, well known Australian strength coach, and then the New Rules of Lifting series. And then when I get to Lean Muscle Diet, uh, which came out in 2014, which I wrote with Alan Aragon. Really, that goes went back to my first book, Testosterone Advantage Plan, with some similarities. We emphasized protein, and uh, you know, we, it wasn't a strict low carb or low fat diet. It was basically how to manipulate those things to match your own goals. So it did go back. I kind of went full circle. Is r rather than jumping off in a new direction, I kind of went full circle back to where I started. And you went full circle because the principles were ultimately the same. They, they were the same, and that was something that I wouldn't, if you had told me that in 2000, because see, in 2000, to come out with a book that emphasizes protein, that tells people it's okay to eat fat, and in fact, they should, um, and that carbs were actually the, you know, the macronutrient that's causing the problems, at that time, working for a company called, uh, I was working at, at Rodale, which published uh, Runner's World Prevention Magazine, and then, and then, of course, men's health, where I was working. And it was just carbs, 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 carbs. Fat's going to make you fat. You know, everyone eats too much protein. Nobody needs that much protein. And we were saying, yeah, you know, more protein, more strength training, not as much cardio. We were stupidly anti-cardio, which in retrospect, I, I truly regret. Um, but at the time, they, these things were, it was just so radical to tell people, you want to lose weight. Strength train, eat more protein, eat fewer carbs, exact opposite of everything we were saying in, in magazines and everything we were saying in the mainstream at that time. So that was my big um, controversial leap. And honestly, the principles 
laid out there, I think, other than the stupid anti-cardio stuff. Um, pretty, you know, haven't really gotten past those. I still think they make perfect sense. I still think they work for most people. Picking up on the cardio point, it's obviously, it's almost very trendy in fitness to be anti-cardio. You know, right. like, oh, cardio's for weaklings and all that kind of stuff. And I know bazillions <laughs> of people that will only go and lift weights and might do yeah. a token 15-minute session on the cross trainer at a very right. low to moderate intensity. And, you know, I personally believe that cardio, again, is a very essential, I'm going to call it a skill. It's also a, yeah. to a certain level, it's a physiological necessity. When you're Absolutely. looking or advising people, what kind of balance do you, and obviously this is goal dependent, but for a normal healthy person, what kind of balance of cardio and lifting do you want to see? Because I, I just still see them both as essential. Well, I, I do too, but I don't think uh, that you have to do, I think you can do, if you really love running or swimming or cycling, or you just like um, to take, you know, classes at the at, at the gym, whether it, you know, Zumba or yoga or whatever it is, and you don't like conventional strength training, well, there's a minimal amount of strength training you can do that will probably serve you throughout life, and then go for your passion. Um, again, I get back to as long as you have these this baseline. Physical capacity, as long as you keep above, you know, five mets or you've got an ability to, to hit a certain number of watts, you know, that's what's going to keep you alive. And you can uh, you can get to that level of physical capacity doing mostly strength training. And then we can put in some metabolic work at the end. We can have you do some intervals or, or, or some other, you know, just like some complexes where you're moving through a lot of exercises quickly and we're not focusing on strength. You've still got the iron in your hands. But what you're doing is you're 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 impre increasing your cardiovascular fitness and also your work capacity, and that's going to help you live longer. Even though you're probably doing it so you can get leaner, or so you can work up a good sweat and feel like you got a good workout, or just so you can get people off your back who tell you you should do more cardio, whatever it is. I don't think there's a number that works for everybody, and I would be opposed to anybody trying to come up with a number and say everybody needs to do this because everybody doesn't have the same interests or the same energy level. Um, one thing that I think is a, is a key principle in all this is if you insist that people have to do something they don't want to do, they won't do anything. They won't do the thing they want to do, and they won't do the thing you told them to do. If you can kind of nudge them toward what they're passionate about and then work from what they're passionate about to uh, sort of a higher intensity or higher volume or whatever it is that increases their overall health, fitness, body composition, whatever their goals are, now you're getting somewhere because now you've made a real convert. Now you've turned somebody um, into, into uh, you, you've taken a non-exerciser and helped that person become an exerciser. And it's not up to us to decide, to judge how they did it or whether, or, 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 to, or to lecture them about how they could get even better benefits if they did something else. The point is they, they're not interested in something else. We've helped them get better at what they want to do, and we've helped them feel good about what they want to do and feel good about themselves, and the rest of it, we just got to back off at that point and basically just, you know, you go. You know, <laughs> it's all you. You do it. You're great. You're doing better all the time. You don't like the same stuff I like. I get that. That's none of my business. Mm. I think, you know, what I want to get at is that, you know, like you said, if you love lifting weights, it's cool, do that. But incorporate right. a component where you challenge the cardiovascular system. So whether you Absolutely. do a Metcon at the end of a circuit of exercises and, right. you you know, you have five, eight, ten minutes work where you're like, shit, that was really hard. Like, I'm really out of breath. So that when you go to right. walk right. four flights of stairs you're not the guy that's puffing at the top of it like you've got asthma. Right. You're, you're running up two steps at a time and you're at the top going, what the hell's taking you guys so long? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, okay, so I have this, now I have this cardiovascular fitness that I didn't aspire to, but I got it anyway because I was doing the stuff I really liked, whether, you know, maybe it was doing, doing you know, metabolic circuits, maybe it was like pushing a sled and I could feel like a big badass by loading every plate in the gym on that sled and pushing it but I'm still improving my cardiovascular fitness. I'm still improving my work capacity. I just made it look like strength training. Mm. So 
we've kind of picked up on some principles uh, of what you believe is foundational. You've right. been in fitness for a long time. What lessons do you think outside of the principles that we've discussed, you want to let the audience know about? Because I think if we wound back the clock, there's probably a couple of things you'd like to uh, tell your younger self. So what other lessons have you learned that you think, do you know what, guys, don't skip this stuff? Yeah, well, I, I would probably have told my younger younger self to get a really good basic book on strength training. And I certainly would have focused more on, uh, um, I didn't know what macronutrients were <laughs> until I, until I went to work, uh, at a magazine in 1992. So I really wish I would have known that. I wish I would have focused more on protein and, uh, understood a little bit about, um, you know, timing that after my workout, you know, eat some, uh, you know, something with a lot of protein. Um, wish I would have, wish I would have known that. Um, wish I would have understood how much I didn't know. I mean, I would like give people fitness advice and stuff before I knew shit because I thought, okay, well, I've been working out for a long time and I belong to gyms and I do all this stuff. So I'm going to give people advice unsolicited sometimes. Uh, really wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> That's probably, it's probably my biggest regret. I can look back and realize all the stuff I didn't know. And, um, the, the part I regret most is that I thought I knew more than I did. Mm. Uh, so that that's, you know, it, it humbling in retrospect, but I'm glad I learned all that stuff. And I kind of wish I would have known it sooner, but what the hell, you know, you only get one life. So um, I, I'm just glad I did learn it better late than now. So with a, with a lot of knowledge of fitness and seeing trends come and go, I'm interested if I could give you a crystal ball, what do you see as coming in the future of fitness? Or what also do you want to see coming in the future of fitness? Well, okay, I'll tell you what I want to see. I don't know what's coming. I wouldn't have predicted CrossFit. I wouldn't have predicted uh, obstacle course racing, which both have an incredibly passionate. I never would have guessed the kettlebell would become a sport. Um, I, <laughs> I just read an article in the New York Times last week, and I, I highly recommend it. Um, uh, it. It should be up on their uh, on their website. They were talking about how weird the sports culture in Finland is, and they've got like wife carrying, and they've got like soccer that they play in a, a football that they play in a swamp, which is just. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, well, you know, here's the thing about Finland is they make this stuff really fun. They're, they're drinking the whole time. I'm sure that the people who win actually tried to win, but not everybody who's competing is actually trying to win. And so I thought I could see that as one really cool future is how about we make this fun? I, I used, I've had this fantasy for ages where you have a gym class for people who sucked at gym class in school. I don't know what you, did you call it in the UK, were physical education classes where basically they exist to humiliate people who aren't like the, the athletic stars. Um, and, and have a gym class where everybody gets to be a stud. So you're giving people a good workout, but you're doing stuff like everybody gets to throw a touchdown pass, everybody gets to touch a, catch a touchdown pass, everybody gets to kick a goal, you know, you pull out some, you know, some, you know, street hockey equipment, everybody gets to hit a goal, but what you're doing is you're making people run around in between and stuff, so everybody's getting a good workout, but while you're getting a good workout, you actually get to win at something with the understanding that you're not actually beating people, you just get to, like, do something and go, yay, and everybody cheers for you. I think that would be like, I think people would be so excited to do that, especially the people who would be the least likely to be in the gym anyway. Um, I think that would be really fun to do. When it comes to the other stuff that's trendy now, um, I think there are going to be a lot of people five, ten years from now who are going to look back and go, damn, what was I thinking with that CrossFit? I, I mean, God, well, look what I did. And, you know, there's going to be so many chiropractors and orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists who are going to have vacation homes all over the world because of all these people who are doing these really extreme things that A, don't need to be done, and B, their bodies are not suited for. It, it is astounding. And, and, I, and I understand that this, you know, and, and the basic principles of CrossFit I think are really cool. But the actual practice of it, I have never talked to anybody who didn't get hurt. 
Well, one, one woman at my gym who, if you looked at her, you would say, yeah, she's built for this. I mean, she's a trainer there, very smart, uh, you know, good at Olympic lifting, all this stuff. Uh, but but I, I, I get into conversations with people and, I say, and they say, oh, where'd you learn to do this or that? And I say, well, I write about this stuff, so I've come across it all the time. And I'll say, what do you do? And they go, well, I was doing CrossFit. And I'll, and I'll stop them and go, man, you got hurt. Well, yeah, but it was my fault because I was doing this. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> it wasn't your fault. You got hurt because you were doing something that you really, your body just isn't designed to do. Mm-hmm. I don't know if anybody that's designed to do kipping pull-ups or super high, you know, all these jumps and stuff. I said, wait till you turn 50 and you realize all of a sudden a knee ligament goes when you're doing one of those jumps. And you're like, I've done thousands of jumps. Why did my knee go out there? I said, well, it's just really just a matter of time. You know, because we're not built to do these things repetitively uh, to put that kind of stress both on the eccentric and concentric and eccentric jumping and landing. Eventually, something's going to break. And that's, you know, you can't look through human history and say we evolved to do. You can say we evolved to do all these things. You can't say we evolved to do them all as repetitively as we do in these more hardcore extreme workouts and i know it feels great to know that you're doing something really extreme but all i gotta say is at some point you're gonna be 50 and you're gonna be 60 and you're gonna look back and go what the hell was i thinking so with that in mind do you think that the practice of crossfit in a way just basically needs 10 20 30 percent of the intensity taken out of it to make it a more longevity sport because The way that you're speaking, I can kind of see where you're coming from. And I'm making a comparison to myself as a rugby player. Like, there's only so long I can play rugby because the forces that you experience are are high. And I think what you're saying at CrossFit, at the top end, there's only so much capacity that the body has to do that stuff. Right. And what I have, what I've heard and what I've read and people I've interviewed have told me this is uh, the other thing is, and this especially I think affects the women, is that there's so much to it. There are so many different physical qualities you have to develop that it develops this, it it sort of creates this ethos of being constantly in training. You know, that if you take one day off, you're slacking. If you take two days off, you're on vacation. If you take, you know, if you if you try to periodize these workouts, it's probably not going to work all that well because you're not developing all these you know, physical capacities. So I can't put any number on it, like reducing, uh, you know, something by 20 or 30% or, or whatever the number would be. I would just say that, you know, the body isn't meant to do these, these extreme things as repetitively as the sport requires. And I would be, you know, if I could, I, I would never try to talk somebody out of doing something they're really passionate about. But um, at, at, at the same time, I just worry that we're just creating this mass of people who are going to have such problems with their, with their shoulders and their backs and their hips and their knees uh, going forward that when they get to be my age, they're going to be just, you know, just the, the, the carnage is going to be um, uh, uh, astronomical. Hmm. Uh, and I can, I can hear that. I see that. Um, I, do you disagree? I mean, no, I, I, I don't. I don't mean to. I've never done CrossFit. I don't want to dump on it. I know lots of smart people who love it and who train in it, but I just worry that people who aren't put together uh, as solidly as the people who are really good at this sport um, are are just injuring themselves, and they come out and they go, "It's my fault. I was doing something wrong. I should have done this. I should have. I should not have done that." But it's like, no, no, no. That's just not. That's not the program for you. Your body is not. You know, your 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 body is not wired for that. Your body is not wired in a way that's going to make that possible for you. I uh, yeah, I don't disagree. Uh, the way I paint a lot of fitness pictures for people is that everyone has a certain capacity to do something. And as you just mentioned, the top level athletes with great genetics, great frames, great ability and mobility right. have great capacity to do these movements. And right. some people's bodies will not be able to handle it. Some people's um, just literally genetic capability to handle stress and load is literally not there. But I also right. link this to our modern day capacities to handle massive amounts of training load because most of us are not getting to bed on time. We've got a lot of work stress. Right. Like And going into CrossFit and smashing your body 
every day, again, right. might not be the best thing for you as a person. Well, again, I don't, want to, I don't want to pass judgment on what any individual does, um, but it is um, this kind of one-size-fits-all, this worship of the outlier. Um, this guy can do it. I'm inspired. I'm going to go try to do what this guy did. It's like, you're not that guy. You know, you're not that woman. You, you, that person is different from you. This person who posts these, you know, Instagram photos of herself, you know, three weeks after she gives birth to her ninth kid. And it's like, look at me, I got abs, you know, and then, and then sort of like shaming all other mothers out there. It's like, that's one person. How many people do you think she represents? And how many people do you think uh, would even be, it would even be possible after giving birth multiple times to have a body that bounces back like that? I, I in, in my real world experience, it's extremely rare, but once you see it on Instagram and once somebody's talking about it, and people are sharing it, all of a sudden you start to think, I should be able to do that. And I think that that kind of infects, um, I don't know if infects is the right word, but it certainly has a, has a uh, it gives people a perverse incentive to sort of resent who they are and not work to their own, to become their own best self and to try to become somebody else's best self. I, I do think that there's a lot more pressure in, in that direction than, than certainly there was when I started. Um, and that I, think is worrisome mm. ultimately people need to find and explore their own path and passion and i think sure. with looking at any top level athlete we have to appreciate that they are a top level athlete they are in right. that position because they have a certain greater advantage than us genetically and don't get me wrong yes. they've applied hard work and absolutely we are always going to be 10 20 30 percent off their ability to apply and advance that capacity. And, you know, if our body is breaking under a certain amount of pressure, we have to be honest with ourselves, stand back and go, do you know what? I have to be, I have to be happy with, you know, 20% behind that guy because that is my genetic capability. Absolutely. And, and, and another point, which I know you touched on, is just the ability to do that kind of work is itself a genetic capacity. If, if you can, if you can do as much work as a, um, as an elite marathoner or, or any distance, at, uh, any elite endurance athlete, if you can do as much work as an elite power lifter has to do, if you can do as much work as an elite bodybuilder has to do, that is something that is, um, you can certainly work up to being able to do a lot more than you can now, but being able to do as much as those people at the very top can do, again, it's probably not in the cards for most of us. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, I have always resented, I think even from the very beginning when I started working in fitness magazines, resented anyone who put out this idea that because one guy can do it, everybody can do it, or because elite people can do it, that we should be inspired and that we should go off and do it. Um, I have always thought that that was uh, just, just a horrible message to send out to people. Um, if you want to be inspired, yeah, you know, you can read about how hard this guy worked and maybe think of how to apply that so you could work harder than you're working now. But to aspire to what the elite can actually do, I think is a, um, it's just it's 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 the wrong message. It's a negative message. It's a self defeating message. I think it it sort of sets people up for failure rather than success. Mm. Yeah, I just think we need to uh, know our own limits. You know, I I look at sure. I look at a professional rugby player, and there's elements that I aspire to in my game. But there's also elements I stand back and like, I'm never going to be able to do that. So I don't yeah. ever set myself up for failure really trying because inherently right. I just know that's not within my capacity. But that doesn't stop me from trying hard the majority sure. of the stuff that I want to be better at. Well, well of course. And most people, uh, especially somebody who's untrained, uh, who's coming at this from the beginning, you don't know what your body's capable of. There's this one guy, I love to talk about him. His name is John Gesselberg. And he started reading my stuff in Men's Health back in the early 2000s. I think he started that first book I mentioned, The Testosterone Advantage Plan. This guy had never trained. And he was maybe in his 40s when he started lifting. And within 10, 15 years, this guy was deadlifting well over 400 pounds at a body weight of about 180, 190 maybe. So he, he had vaulted well you know, I think he was certainly well past double body weight uh, deadlift. 
So here's a guy who started reading my stuff. He'd never trained at all, and he was became much stronger than I ever got. He was doing 100 push-ups every night before bed. You know, this guy was this guy's fantastic. He's a guy you never would have heard of, and he's a guy who never, if he hadn't started reading about this stuff and gotten interested in it, he never would have known what he was capable of. That he could be this strong. That he could be this fit. That he could have this energy and and this and this passion for uh, for fitness and and by extension for other aspects of his life. So the person who hasn't tried doesn't know what they can do. Now the people like you and me who have really tried, you've tried in, in rugby, and I know you lost a lot of weight early in your early in your career with me. Um, you know, I, I I gained a bunch of weight, which was satisfying for about 15 minutes until I realized I was fat, and then I said I better go back to being skinny because you know that's going to be much healthier, especially as, as I got older. So, um, you know, we are different from the people we're trying to help. And certainly the people we're trying to help are, are, are whatever motivates them. We kind of, it's, it's on us to help them discover that it's going to be different for every person. So, um, I, I think that the more we can individualize what we do, uh, the better service we're doing. But at the same time, how do you reach all these people individually? That's the, uh, uh, always the problem and that's what some things like CrossFit have been great at is look people look at them and go that looks like fun maybe that's for me yoga that looks great maybe that's for me I'm going to run a marathon that's for me that'll motivate me mm-hmm. or they'll see a new diet oh uh, you know ketogenic diet put butter in my coffee hey man that sounds great I'll try uh, I love butter I love coffee I'll try that so we get people kind of pumped up and sometimes we get them pumped up to go to an extreme before they've done all these intermediate steps that for us preceded these extremes and for the athletes preceded these extremes. People want to jump straight from this to that. And maybe that's the area where we could be the most help is, is, is helping people understand what those intermediate steps are and maybe getting them excited about those intermediate steps rather than thinking, okay, if I can't just jump right into CrossFit or I can't run this marathon, what's the point? Well, we can help them find the point maybe. I know I've said maybe like until like ten times in the last five minutes, but um, I, I guess the older you get, the more you realize the limitations of your own insights. <laughs> well, and the thing with fitness is there's lots of if, buts, maybe's context, um, and that's why sure. you rarely get a black and white answer off a fitness professional because everyone has their own body, their own way of doing things, right. their own goals, their own desires, and I think. We've expanded really nicely on the conversation today, Lou, kind of around that. So I think that's really positive. Um, Talking about your books, uh, I want to direct people to your books because you've written a lot of incredible books. Uh, The Lean Muscle Diet with Alan Aragon is a great book. The New Rules of Lifting. uh, All these books are on Amazon, aren't they? Yes, uh, at Amazon, and and I I don't, you know, if there are any bookstores left, (laughs) you might be able to find them there. Uh, really, the paradigm-changing book for us was the uh, New Rules of Lifting for Women. Um, you know, it seems strange now, but when we started writing that book in 2006 and when it came out in January 2008, nobody in the mainstream fitness publishing world was telling women that it's that the goal of strength training is to get stronger, pushing them to lift heavier weights, do these basic movement patterns – getting them away from the, you know, getting them out of the yoga studio and the cardio room. Um, so that was like the paradigm changer. But I think that the best book in the series is the latest strong. Um, it's, it's, we, we wrote it as a follow-up to new rules for women, but I recommend, I've done the workouts. I've recommended them. Oh, I should say my co-author Alan Cosgrove's workouts. Um, we have, uh, I, I think that's the, that is the book where I would recommend that people start now. Ah, okay. Well, in theory, your latest book should be your best book because you've learned to be better. <laughs> I, I, I hope so. I hope so. Always uh, uh, always learning. Otherwise, Lou, you haven't really learned, have you, son? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, sometimes, sometimes though, it, it's amazing that the earlier books outsell the later ones uh, because people go back to the first ones and sometimes – and there's something in there, um, sort of that spark of, you know, Alan and me – Believing that we had something new and different to offer, sometimes people like that more than they like the later books where it feels like we're constantly, well, as we said in this book, as we said in that book, with all the nuance and all the stuff we've learned over the years, some people actually prefer 
back when we were so sure of ourselves, you know, that uh, this is this and that's that and here's how you do it. Lou, thank you very much for being on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Aside from your books on Amazon, if people want to come and find you, where is the best place for them to come and find and follow your work? If they go to um, louschuler.com, L-O-U-S-C-H-U-L-E-R.com, uh, they can get links to uh, articles I've written, all the books, uh, my How to Get Published, which I wrote with John Romanello um, and Sean Heisen, where we talked about how to get into fitness publishing, which a lot of people are interested in. Um, uh, I wrote a novel called Saints Alive. You can find the links there, which uh, I highly recommend, uh, just so that so I can say that somebody actually read my fiction. So, uh, you know, I don't update my blog anymore, but the site itself will give you links to everything I do. Nice. Well, Lou, thank you very much again for being on the show. For people that have seen this on social media, please show us some love. Give us a retweet, like it on Facebook, tag someone in that you think can benefit from this show. If you want or feel compelled to give Lou a high five on social media, then tag him in, say something, because he would appreciate that just as would I. Uh, if you've never uh, left a review for this show before on iTunes, please leave a review. It helps the show grow on iTunes and it would be hugely appreciated. Lou, thank you again. Thanks, Ben. It was really fun. Appreciate it. And for all of you listening to the show, I will be back next week with other, either another amazing guest or another special Q&A with myself and my lovely co-host, Tom. In the meantime, everyone, stay awesome. Hey, everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 272.